Hello, Luke here. I would just like to take a moment to disclose up front that we sometimes talk about sensitive topics in our podcasts, and in fairness to our audience, we will try our best to put specific warnings in the descriptions of each episode. Now on with the show. And welcome to the Nostalgia Killers podcast, where we revisit films from our youth to see if they still hold up or should be inserted into the great DVD player in the sky. I'm Luke Lund, and I'm joined today by my great friend, Erica Smolin, a.k.a. DJ Two Smalls. What, what? (laughs) And we watched Back to the Future. Back to the Future. Steven Spielberg presents Back to the Future, a Robert Zemeckis film. Marty leads an ordinary life. No McFly ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. Well, history is going to change. And 1985 is not his year. But Dr. Brown is about to change all that. Are you telling me you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? He's sending Marty 30 years back in time. It works! It's a flying saucer from outer space! Now, he's trapped in the past. This has got to be a dream. About to meet... Chocolate. ...his future father. He's a baby. Tough. Wow! And he's making an impression on his mother. He's an absolute dream. And he can sleep in my room. Ah. Anything you do could have serious repercussions on future events. Now, he's got to make his mother and father fall in love. For crying out loud, I haven't even been born yet. And only Dr. Brown... Can help him get back to the future. Are you telling me that this sucker is nuclear? Precisely. Michael J. Fox. Whoa, this is heavy. Christopher Lloyd. There's that word again, heavy. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? Back to the future. All right, the, uh, so the movie pitch, uh, the one I found, there's a bunch of them. Because this movie's been around, it's so popular, it's beloved. Oh, Marty McFly, a 17-year-old high school student, is accidentally sent 30 years into the past in a time-traveling DeLorean invented by his close friend, the maverick scientist Doc Brown. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that kind of, that says what happens, but it doesn't say everything. So it's, it's pretty good. It doesn't spoil the movie. I, I like that one. True that. It doesn't um, say a whole lot at all. No, no. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's very, very top level. Uh, yeah, not very deep. So, uh, what's your the nostalgia, nostalgia for you for this for this film? How did it? How is it? Well, I was thirteen, so seminal age, as they say, and I probably saw it in the theater. I would say at least ten times, probably right. more. <laughs> right on. Probably saw it total at least twenty times in my life, probably more. Right. So I was in love with Michael J. Fox. We got the eighties. We sure. have family ties. I think. Teen Wolf was after this. Just after, yeah. Right? Um, and yeah, it was my room was littered with um, cutouts from all the teen magazines of Michael J. Fox. <laughs> That's and, great. Uh, yeah, I was, I was obsessed, even though he was... How old was he again when he, he did was this movie? 20, 23. Yeah. So he was, he was smoking, little, smoking... 10 years older? Yeah, smoking cigarettes with uh, the director behind the, behind the camera. <laughs> but. I love it. <laughs> um for for me um i was five and i was go i was in five or six i was going to first grade in columbus georgia and i saw it at my friend lauren's apartment she was i think at my same age but her mother happened to work for a tv studio for she was a programmer for television so she had a, a screener of the of the movie so we actually saw it right about the same time it was in theaters on VHS and we watched it like 20 times Well, you know, it was just me, Lauren and our, and our friend Monty, like the, the neighborhood kids, you know, wreaking havoc in a living room, jumping on the couch and watching this movie over and over and over. And that's my connection to this film. It's just, <laughs> what do you mean a screener? Like, I like, a, like before other people got to see it. Yeah. So like, what? so when, when movies go out to critics and stuff, so that there, there, is, there are critics. There's, you know, people can give stars before the movie even comes out. They send pre-release screeners to critics 
TV executives, things like that. So yeah, I, I mean, I don't know, remember what exactly when it was, but I do remember that there was a little bar on the bottom of the screen saying screener only. No, do not reproduce. No. Do not send out. Yeah. No. I'm not even entirely sure we were supposed to be watching it. We were, you know, five and six year old kids alone in, a, in an apartment, you know, just, <laughs> just, uh, you know, just being kids and watching this movie. That's crazy. And then uh, one other really strong attachment I had to this film is uh, probably a couple years later, I was sitting in a room with my aunt and my grandmother and we were, we were watching it and my aunt was noting all the cuss words. And my grandmother was writing down the times because she owned a Christ Christian bookstore and she was going to overdub all the bad words to, in order to rent oh. it in, in her shop. With what? Like, darn. Just, just, just silence. Just silent? Just nothing? Yeah, yeah just nothing. Just, uh, you know, so just, just cut it out. No, no audio. <laughs> but, uh, but I was, you know, still like eight or nine years old. But because my, my mother is pretty liberal, I was allowed to sit there. And and watch the movie and listen to all the cuss words. So my aunt, my aunt would just say every now and again, "Shit, damn, <laughs> shit," <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I'm like, there were not a lot of curse words in that. No, movie. no, no. But that that's a very strong memory to me is is sitting there with with my family. <laughs> just uh. Wow. Yeah. I was like running out of friends to go see the movie with because <laughs> you know I would do that with every movie I, that I loved. I just run through all my friends my side sure. friends my that's awesome cousins whoever i i have this later for in trivia but um this movie was number one at the box office for three whole months and that's that's sure. that's still a record sure that's insane and that's I, i'm insane. The, the more we do these older movies i'm realizing that th this was their only venue you know we didn't have streaming services so if it if it still made money they kept it in theaters and you can tell like Things like Indiana Jones, um, yeah, I mean, you you can tell how much the zeitgeist loved the movie by how long it stayed in the box office. And this Back to the Future number one still has the record. And it looks like it was released in the summer, which is like super popular time. July third, right? and like yeah, people it's, went to oh July third there. How convenient. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into that later. I'm sure. Oh no, we can talk about it now. Just in terms of the um, patriotism. Sure. Uh, one one weird thing is that the so the movie cost nineteen million to make. Its opening weekend, it only made just about eleven. Mm. So people weren't exactly going to the theater right away. They they were doing. They, they may have miscalculated the July Fourth crowd. Gotcha. But uh, the movie did end up making uh, two hundred thirteen million. Oh. So like in it, that year. Yeah, well, in gross, so like in gross, okay. in like theater, and then um, I think v video sales later and all that stuff. But uh, it did it, it it succeeded immensely, but just not that first weekend, which was a little strange. That is so strange. People even, were into their hot dogs and hamburgers I, and I guess so. fireworks. Maybe there there were a bunch of other movies coming out at that in that summer. I think uh, Top Gun. Oh yeah, that may have been eighty six. Uh, I'll have to relook that up, but there was a like summer movies back then was over <laughs> overshadowed each other a lot. That's true. But but once oh, this I miss those days, <laughs> but once this movie took off, you know, it's like we said, it stayed number one for three whole months. Oof, that's just that's insane. Unheard of. So how, how about uh, any specific scenes for you? You know, I love for some reason I love all those uh, coffee shop scenes. The diner. Yeah, or yeah. to diner. Yeah, yeah, um, I like it too. Just the, I mean, specifically the first one. Just you know, he's sitting right next to his dad. <laughs> they do the same motions. We do the same motions. We got Biff. We have the. I don't know what that camera angle is called, but you see his face. He, they did a lot of that in this movie. I noticed, like, yeah, his reaction, sideways camera face reaction, whatever mm -hmm. that is it was called. A, Dean Dean Kundi is the. Uh, the cinematographer so it's it's very very rich cinema wise but yeah yeah yeah, for yeah. Sure. a lot of closes close-ups and just reactions and and michael j fox it was just i just remember oh. laughing so much in the theater and everyone laughing around me now that's kind of hard to imagine right but just like laughing at those reactions and just the 
you know, Biff coming in, we're intruded to Biff and his, his cronies. Yeah. Um, and even the scene with uh, Lorraine when he's first asking her out and she gets kind of a glimmer like, oh, maybe this guy has something to him in terms of George asking her out. Right. Being his. Very, very shortly. Uh, I'm, yeah. your, I'm your density. I'm your density. <laughs> the crisp old, oh, Crispin Glover. Oh, Crispin Glover. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, and yeah, so that's one. I have a few more. You want me to yeah. talk about them now? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, and then I think right after that, going into the whole skateboard scenario. That, I mean, that's one I have written the, down is like the whole sequence yeah. is, is really beloved to me. Even now, I'm just like, that was rad. Even yeah. though it wasn't even like <laughs> anything. It wasn't Fast and Furious. It wasn't anything major happening. Right. It wasn't Black Panther level of like a chase scene. But it was like, you know, he's going from car to car, wooden skateboard, and then to end up in the shit pile. Come yeah. on. Yep. Yeah, it's classic. And they, they do that gag for the next two movies, which is great. Do they? Oh, that's right. Where he always, oh, yeah. always ends up in manure. Always ends up in manure, hauling manure. <laughs> um, and then the dance. I always love the dance. I love any dance scene, anything okay. with some choreography and some music. Um, the whole Johnny Be Good thing. You know, if you're in love with Michael J. Fox, then he's and he was really playing guitar in parts of that, right? Uh, he he was showing how he was. was he was showing how to do the motions because he plays guitar or did. Um, in, in my, in my research, it was, it was all overdubbed, um, okay. but he was, was, he was, he was shown how to, where to put his hands. So it looks like he's, uh, he's doing a fair better job than most people do when they're pretending to Luke, play an do instrument. do not ruin my childhood fantasy. All right. I'll right just, now. we'll just, I'll, uh, we'll edit that <laughs> part out. tell me? Yeah. yeah he's, he was playing he and really... singing. That's really his singing voice too. Thank you. No. <laughs> Don't ruin my 13 year old love affair. <laughs> well, that's, that's the podcast. I'm sorry. Uh, all right. You killed my nostalgia no, no. just there. No, no you can't. You can't. I, I, only in this research for me, I realized I, um, I learned that they actually had to overdub most of the movie. So, like, really? even, even, um, I'm even listening to it now, I can hear it. But before, I, could, I never could tell. It always sounded really clean to me. So, it was really well done. But especially during the, um, the storm scenes, in order to get the wind kicked up, they had to use an actual like jet engine. So there was no, <laughs> no taking audio from that. So everything that's outside during the storm is overdubbed in a studio booth afterwards. Wasn't everything overdubbed? Over, over they overdubbed. did a lot. They did a lot. That was, it was kind of factored in, but okay. not, not this much. Like pretty much listening to it again, I can tell almost everything was overdubbed. Oh, wow. Oh, I'll have so, to watch it again then with that. Yeah, with, with that I, do, do with headphones. That's how I, I watch them. Okay. And you okay. can tell, you can tell, like, you, sometimes it sounds cagey, like they're in a booth. Sometimes the, the environment doesn't quite match. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to pay more attention. No, I don't but, want to actually. More nostalgia killing. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not going to do it. Uh, just, just, I really couldn't, couldn't pick like my favorite scenes in the movie, but I did notice the gas prices in 1985. They were a dollar ninety in the Texaco, in in California. Even even for back then, that's a lot. But that's it was California. But I could I could live with that now. Let me tell you. Uh, (laughs) I I just passed the gas station today. It's back up over five dollars. So wait, so it was really it said that I don't remember that. Yeah, it was was one. That seems like a lot for them. I don't know. Was it supposed to take place in California? That's my other question. I don't think they named the place, but it's kind of obvious that it's the outskirts of LA. Sure looks like it. I mean, that, that is exactly where they filmed it, but uh, in the movie, I don't think they really... It could be Middletown anywhere. That's how they kind of set it up. The twin pine to the lone pine. Yeah. But are there pines? Yeah, there's pines. I oh, guess. yeah. There's, there's Lone Pine, California. I mean, there's... Okay. True. All out there. How about any? Uh, right. any how about any bad scenes? Did you notice any, did you notice that you didn't like this time? <laughs> yeah, well, um, sure. I don't like any rapey scenes. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> are, I mean, I don't think there's any bad scenes in terms of the movie cinema wise. I just think the content looking back on it is, you know, even then you got an icky feeling. You're like, whoa, Biff's hand is up her dress yeah 
and she's like pleading for help like that's pretty dire goes on a long time too a long time it, yeah, yeah and like her legs are in the air and that that just struck me as wrong and then she just gets up and goes with the next guy who saves her to the dance and falls in love yeah it's Doop-de-do. written written by old dudes yeah uh, that's a theme we're noticing going back to all these old movies is that uh kind of just gets brushed off and overlooked and like yeah yeah no big deal but yep just a little 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 potential sexual assault hanging out in there <laughs> little yeah. peeping tom and then the guy she ends up with was like <laughs> a peeping tom uh, a peeping tom yeah stalkery peeping tom delightful you know the, okay here's here's the thing in terms of scenes i never really could get into i felt like it was it's not superfluous but it always felt superfluous i don't know that if that's in terms of what that means but the whole lightning striking the clock tower right he has to get back that's the way to get back but it's i don't know i was always kind of done at that point (laughs) maybe not maybe not the first time yeah but maybe just because i knew it was coming sure i was kind of shut down i'm like okay like going through the motions ah we're scared the thing falls you got to catch it i don't know there's something about that and I haven't figured out what it was that I was just, I'm, I'm kind of done with the movie at that point. Right on. I never thought of it that way, but I can totally see it. Um, yeah. I mean, they're just kind of tying things up the end, you know, doc doesn't want to know his future. Marty wants to tell him. And in my research for the film this time, the, uh, the script went through a lot of revisions and mm. I, I read some of the earlier stuff that they did. I don't have, I unfortunately didn't write it down cause I'm very professional. <laughs> But uh, it's wildly bad, the other stuff that they had. <laughs> the, other, the other idea is like the time machine was supposed to be a fridge. What? How boring would that have been? That's so boring. Uh, it, it was basically the refrigerator and the nuclear explosion in uh, Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull. It was, that was I don't bas- even remember basically, that, but sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's r- totally ridiculous. But uh, yeah, so like you, you being checked out at the end of the film, I can totally get because there's... There's a lot of things in here that don't doesn't work for everybody. Uh, once it gets, you know, it bounces between emotions, but it also gets gets sciency, and that the science, even the people who are into the science of it, are like, no, that's stupid, that's bad, right? So it's <laughs> that's it's, it's, it's not it's not it's not a, yeah. People people talk about this movie like it's a the perfect film. It's taught at UCLA. The script being like the right. perfect the perfect screenplay ever written. Blah blah blah. But yeah, I I did for me. Watching it this time, and like I've I've seen I do I listen to a lot of essays and stuff about film anyway, so I've I've been doing research on this film for the past twenty years anyways. But what I noticed big big time this time when it happened was that they really whitewashed Chuck Berry's music. Not not to not to trance your uh, one of your favorite scenes, but having the white guy come in and be the hero. Uh, yeah, it's just wow. It's not even subtle anymore. It's just, it kind of just hits you on the face. Well, not only that, I mean, and then the whole idea like, Goldie's going to run for mayor because he suggests it. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's basically like the white guy saves the world. Yeah. It's, it's very white knight on everything and whitewashed. I I don't even, I can't even say, but, but that's, that's. (laughs) The way this is written, and this is actually written, the, their whole idea for this started in the 70s. So they worked on this for like 13 years oh before they got it made. So it went through a lot of different iterations. Oh, wow. And it, the thing is, it never left these two white guys. So they never got yeah. like, consultation from anybody. Not that anybody did back in the 80s. But uh, sure yeah, didn't. That, that for me, talk about tuning out the whole car scene at the end. I kind of tuned out during that. I think mm. I start I started reading something about the movie and I forgot to go back and watch it. Really? But um yeah, I mean I don't know. It's not that I hate it, but you're you're right. It's the the sexual assault is is kind of it's used as a plot point, which is very common unfortunately, but it it is just brushed off. I don't know. Pretty much like, anything to do with Leah Thompson and the mom is just all brushed off. She is just purely um a plot point. Yeah. And they're they're sticking to their 1950s social mentality big time. Uh, Absolutely. E- even in the 80s there's no no changing 
unless someone goes back in time and changes them kind of deal. Um, unless we have anything else, any other good scenes or bad scenes? You want I mean, about? it's going to all go into nitpicks probably. Okay. So. We'll just move on. We'll go to the, uh, this movie is cocktail mocktail, which is, uh, just basically a Pepsi. A what? A Pepsi. It's just a Pepsi. Just like in the film. Um, was it Pepsi free? Pepsi free. So there's the mm. old caffeine free version of Pepsi. Um, <laughs> You, also you could have, add a little, you could do like a, well, I guess you can't. Is it Jack and Coke is Coke? I do, I do it with Pepsi too. But there's also, Lorraine is actually pouring vodka into all her stuff. She's a very Woo. strong alcoholic. Lorraine's got some issues, man. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's treated like it's normal for <laughs> that generation's coping mechanism, I guess. I just read something that said she was uh, depressed. Like a depressed alcoholic. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just, Pepsi's easiest to go with for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. It's the middle of the day. I don't feel like. Yeah. Pour, I, didn't, I didn't have anything for that. I didn't have anything for that. So Pepsi works. Right on. So we'll uh, go ahead and take our first ad break. And we're back with Act hey. 2, The Evidence Board. So yeah. we get some trivia, some making of, behind the scenes, casting mm-hmm. alternates, things like that. So, uh, like we said, it released July 3rd, 1985. Cost $19 million, Ended up making over 212 domestic, over 300 worldwide. Very, very successful. Obviously went on to make number two and three. The, uh, the writer's... Uh, well, it was written by Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale, directed by Robert Zemeckis. They were both told that the studio was going to make sequels with or without them. So they uh, they, they signed on. Smart move. Um, alternate casting. Are you aware of who was Marty yeah. McFly? So Eric Mask. Stoltz. Yeah, Eric, Eric Stoltz. Stoltz. <laughs> um, great actor. Obviously too serious. too serious and rubbed everyone the wrong way. Um, on the film so they they filmed for five weeks oh was he like a jerk on set or something that that a couple, part i co- don't know a couple times yeah is he being like method or something he was totally method he they had a, he had everyone calling him marty instead of eric <gasps> method mcfly yeah exactly <laughs> uh and then and the, the the cafeteria fight scene with biff um he actually pushed uh tom wilson like way too hard Wrote like a lot of times that ended up uh, almost breaking his collarbone. And you heard uh, Biff? yeah, exactly. That's like that's how I can't imagine how wild Eric Stoltz would have to be. But he was taller, you know. And he was also he, it, it worked out cinem- cinematographically later because Biff is Tom Wilson's much taller than than Michael J. Fox, and it just you know it, it set up the the hero villain thing much better. I it's think it's much funnier. It's much yeah, funnier that yeah. way. Yeah, for sure. I forgot her name, but there was also another woman cast as um, Jennifer, who was also the same height as Eric Stoltz. And oh, once, once she never, she never even got to film anything. She got to do like a promotional photo with Eric Stoltz, and she got cut because she was way too tall for Michael J. Fox. <laughs> so that they, they brought in Claudia Wells, who ironically got replaced for the sequels because she was too busy doing other shows. <laughs> What was she in? What else was she in? I soap operas. I I don't remember. I okay. don't remember her. I don't even remember her from this that movie. That sounds familiar. Yeah. But uh, Elizabeth Shoe Elizabeth Shoe yeah. stepped in. That's right. Brilliant. And they, and they like passed her off, and like most people didn't even notice. Oh, travesty! <laughs> travesty. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much all I have for alternative casting. It was this film took thirteen years to get made. Whew. The when they were shopping it around, Zemeckis and, and Gail were shopping it around. Disney, they went to Disney. Disney said hell no because of the uh, incestuous car scene. Really? And then everybody else was like, "We need more of that car scene." They're like, "Hell yeah!" Because things like Fast Times at Ridgemont High, all these raunchy mm-hmm. teen comedies were coming out, and they thought this was going to be a dud. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So this barely got made. Uh, they. They kind of went back with their tails between their legs to their friend Steven Spielberg, who kind of behind the scenes secretly helped produce this. I 
always thought he was the producer for some reason. He's he's, he's an executive producer, okay. which which, which kind of means he doesn't really have a say in what happens in the film, but he helps get the money done. Yeah, and that that's how it got made. I mean, it was it was a good thing. Thank God, Stephen. <laughs> So we got Leah Thompson, Tom Wilson, Crispin Glover, Christopher Lloyd, Wendy Jo Sperber, Mark McClure as Marty's sister and brother. And then we got um, two kind of breakthrough, not breakthrough actors, but like this is their kind of first-ish film is uh, Billy Zane and Courtney Gaines. This is, they're the, they're Biff's uh, lackeys. They look so familiar. Yeah. And so did his siblings. I can't. I know I've seen siblings I, in a million other things. I thought so too, but I don't recognize any of the, <laughs> the stuff they were in. But uh, yeah, oh, really? I mean, yeah. Well, oh, I'm, I, I probably would if I saw it. Maybe. Um, I mean, there's you can you can spend there's more behind the scenes interviews and making of material oh, than than it is of all that. all three episodes. Yeah. Uh-huh. So we we could go on forever and ever about this stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's just a fun fun movie. I just. If if it's if it was so, ever on television, I would leave it where, wherever it landed. I'll finish it. Oh yeah. So the the next section is called the usual suspects, and this one was was somewhat easy, but also I had to like I tried to do it from memory, but I had I had to dig through IMDb. So this is uh, c- movie connections from films that we've done on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So un- unless you're familiar with that list, this won't make a whole lot of sense to you. But uh, I'll I'll go through what I have. Uh, so Leah Thompson, right after this, actually did Howard the Duck. Oh yeah, which which Howard we, we the did. Duck. <laughs> yeah. Um, she also did uh, Wildlife with Eric Stoltz right before this. So that's weird. She, she kind of got cast because she knew Eric. <sighs> um, there's, I mean, there's a bunch. Everyone will tell you a different story, no matter. I mean, depending on who whose interview you're watching. Um, let's see here. Crispin Glover did two episodes of Family Ties with Michael J. Fox, so they they worked together even before oh, they did this movie. That. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, we have to talk about Crispin Glover. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that in a minute. Okay. These are some reaching uh, connections here. So Eric Stoltz and Billy Zane were in Memphis Belle in 1990. Oh. Do you remember that one? I probably saw it, but I did not remember it. Okay, it's it's one of my favorite films. Um, there's a bunch of like big name actors, people you'd recognize now. But uh, yeah, like the whole time I was watching this movie, looking at Billy Zane, like he's he was next to Eric Stoltz in another movie, so I found it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Christopher Lloyd was in Buckaroo Banzai with Peter Weller, uh, who's in RoboCop. That's another episode that we've done. Oh. And that was right. That was kind of how Christopher Lloyd got this job. Uh, Buckaroo Banzai, the one of the producers, recommended him. For this and he came in and, and read and he was from taxi right yes okay. he's in a lot of things actually i was looking at his imdb he's got over 250 credits amazing which is a lot and he's still going he's got 11 more coming out in the he's next still couple years. going yeah he's still going yep whenever i see him i'm just like yes <laughs> and then we got a uh, buck flower who is the bum I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with his history. No. He was a kind of a softcore porn star in the 70s. What? And his his uh, his movie, Orgy American Style, is on the marquee behind him in the scene that he's in. <gasps> no, that's the triple X movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is amazing. But he also went on to, to do, like this film, you know, it's a PG-13, you know, he, he went on to do family comedies and things like that, but he has like the widest range of of, of films what? From, so did they they knew that i mean obviously oh yeah oh yeah it's, it's a very there. very deliberate uh, easter egg in there that's amazing but uh he was also a bum he, he kind of plays a bum in all of his, his movies but he was also in escape from new york with kurt russell and we did overboard a couple episodes <gasps> that's ago that's right um that, that pretty much ties that up um there's some other connections but it's like really really reaching so you want to you want to talk a bit more about crisp and glover <laughs> I mean, I wish I researched more about him. It's just such a, he's such a weird guy. Yes. And it's just, it's such an interesting choice. I mean, it, it totally works, but like, how, how does that even work? I don't know. I've, and everything I learned about him from this film was that 
he was like impossible to work with. Yeah, he's supposed to be really hard to work with. He didn't like the ending. He kept trying to bring in all kinds of really deep <laughs> uh, actor ideas to this yeah. very top level surface character, and he just uh, he's not in the he's not in the sequels. He's not. No. Nope. No. Nope. They, they like Zemeckis was kind of like, eh, no. <laughs> Let's figure out how to do it. So I don't know if you remember the second one. His father's got a a back problem, so he's hanging upside down. So that's how they figured out how to like make his double kind of look even more, even if he doesn't look right, he's upside down. So it was hard. He's to upside tell. down. Yeah. So they did <laughs> oh this God, the whole this. elaborate thing to like cover up that he wasn't in the movie. That he's not there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bummer that he's not there. But he's, I could see it. I could see it not working out. He's, he's a weird guy and a weird actor, but he did bring a lot of depth and interest to that character somehow. And it was always a little off to me, but it always still worked in the same oh yeah same As, all of his all of his uh colleagues his actor friends loved him like they they thought he was the funniest person on set and he was doing the funniest job so it, it's a really weird it's hard to say you know for maybe for the admin he was he's a nightmare but for the the, the character in the movie he, the came, he brought he like brought him. a lot yeah i mean yeah. He, i mean and everything else i've seen him in I, i've always loved him but knowing knowing this about him, I probably would never want to work with him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I'll, like yeah. the uh, what, what's Rivers Rivers brother's name? Joaquin. Yeah, maybe he's like a I don't know. Always kind of reminded me of Joaquin Phoenix sort sort of situation. Sure. Yeah, you hear you hear all kinds of stories, and it's the the weird thing is is that a lot of these actors are going back and forth between theater and movies, and they they maybe have a hard time separating the two because people in, people in theater take it very seriously and they, they study yeah. it hard and it's it's life to them they, they trod the boards that's right that's right <laughs> <laughs> i like him but every time i see him now i'm thinking what how many takes did this director have to you know well, make, that make my the, plane or your plane that's yours you want, you want, you want to wait a minute yeah okay <laughs> so loud. <laughs> i can see that making sense that he's just such a theater theater guy yeah, uh, I mean, well, apparently a lot of his problems on this on this film was that he was so new to acting that he was nervous. <sighs> but he's got a lot of credits from before this film, so it's it's not this wasn't his first rodeo. And didn't he like stop acting for a while or like quit acting? He's, he's got a very or... very sparse IMDb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I and it's and it's really it's a really weird eclectic <laughs> listing of movies i love it um yeah I, I i cherish that he exists on this planet but yeah i don't want to work with him good way to put it <laughs> i'll let him know okay cool <laughs> i'll text him right now all right cool sorry Kristen. not happening you just, you just call him crisp i just call him crispy <laughs> crispy niblets all right you want to move on to nitpicks yeah Ugh, so many <laughs> go for it Oh, man. Well, we got Rapey Biff. Yeah. You know, um, we talked about the car scene, also the whole lunchroom cafeteria scene. He's like basically sexually assaulting her at school. And the, I can't remember the ball, uh, that guy's name, the teacher figure. Uh, St Strickland. Strickland, yeah. James Tolkien. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, that's not even what he comes over to uh, stop. Yeah. It's just like the fight. It's just yeah. like it's it's okay. And she just and just the whole um idea that she's kind of accepted that this is sort of how if you're an attractive, quote unquote, thin, you know, woman right. in the fifties, like these are just kind of things that sort of happen to you and you just have to be like, ugh. ugh. I mean, she does slap him, which I love, but it still takes a man to come over. Right. Defend her honor, also to save her while she's being assaulted. And just a uh, big sigh. Yeah. Big, big sigh there. We have the Libyan nationals. Some more stereotypes. Um, yeah, there, there's some contention about that, too. Um, after 9-11, they did some editing to the film and kind of cut out the whole terrorism angle as much as they could. Did they really? Yeah. So if it was broadcast on television, it, there was an edit. Uh, like the word terror, yeah, the word terrorist was cut out. Um, it was a weird choice, but yeah, it's it's definitely and it's I'm I'm pretty sure those guys weren't Libyan. They were not Libyan. I was going to say I'm sure they were not Libyan. They picked like 
brown people or they put them in brown face or they just put one of those um, scarves to make them look Libyan. I can't remember what they're called on their heads. And then they're like speaking gibberish. Yeah. That are supposed to sound like they're quote unquote speaking, I don't know if it's supposed to be Arabic or what it's supposed to be. They're just like, yeah. And then he says, go like, well, he's also um, wearing, he's wearing a Saudi Arabian headdress. It's not even, that's a what it was. Thing. Yes. It's like, it's oh, so, that was Saudi Arabia. Is it specific? Okay. I did not know. Yeah. That. It's the, it's ignorance. the red, the red but, and yeah. white, red and white checker. That's, that's specifically. Right. See, there you go. Yeah. Like who would know that in the eighties, unless you're uh, from yeah. that culture. If yeah. If you're exactly. like a white 13 year old, you're not going to necessarily know that. So that was annoying to see now and annoying to look back and kill my nostalgia and note them <laughs> that like, I did not, would not have noted that. Also, they were in a VW. Is there something to that? I don't know. I think it was just a California symbol, like the, the VW bus, surf like culture. they were hiding out in that to blend in or something, or? Uh, who knows? This, this film- that was weird. It, this film did cost 19 million, and I'm wondering if they just had a shoestring budget. There were some things they were cutting, you know? Like, yeah. I don't know, what, what would you choose for a vehicle in 1985 for some terrorists? A caddy. Caddy? How would, how would they get the RPG out the window? Kind of want something with a sunroof? No, just do it out the side. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just do it out the side. All right on. Yeah, caddy, a, caddy, one. a caddy might have been able to keep up with a DeLorean, though. That's the... <laughs> right. Yes, much faster than a VW. Yeah. Those, those buses, I don't think, got up to 55. No, they're very slow. Um, oh, yeah. So the whole. Oh, yeah. I was, I was a little upset that Einstein was like, um, you know, what do they call that when you experiment on animals? <laughs> animal, <laughs> animal testing. Yeah. Yeah. It was like the animal tested, like monkeys going into space or something. I was like, yeah. oh, it's Einy. Don't do that. Well, uh, you mentioned that um, it was originally supposed to be a chimpanzee. There you go. So, I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Is the dog better or worse? I guess you have more sympathy for a dog in the 80s or something. I don't know. Yeah, it was it was a, a change made by the studio exec who actually wanted to call the movie uh, Spaceship Man from Pluto or something like that instead of Back oh. to the Future. It was a really oh, bad wow. idea. But he, he had some other demands. Like Lorraine is the name of his, his wife. Whoa. So that, that's why Lorraine's the name is in the movie. Was she a depressed alcoholic? <laughs> I, I, I didn't go that deep into research. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm guessing yes. I mean, no. Um, also, yeah, we talked about peeping Tom. Gross. Ew. Yeah. Stalking. And it's appar- pro- apparently rampant because it's it's not the first one that the, her father's run into. He says, it's one of those dang kids fell, <laughs> ran in front of my car again. Yeah, like everyone's looking. Right. Because <laughs> Lorraine is... <laughs> Oh, and an attractive and a woman. Yeah. Um, I was also a little annoyed at the Jennifer character, just in terms of, or even the moms. It's like all the women are actually not the teenage women um, from the eighties, like the, Marty's sister, but they're all just like the doting girlfriend, the doting mom. Yeah. Window dressing. Oh, are you okay? Like taking care of the man and just blah, finger down throat. Yeah. Uh, once again, written by two old white men. Yeah. Uh, so. What's not, going on for them? Not not excusing it, but that's kind of that's the the genesis of all these. Most of these problems, yeah. Gross. Got any more? No. Okay, uh, I totally agree with all everything you pointed out. There's these these are the things that we find in almost every movie we go back and watch. Oh no, I'm not done. Okay. Sorry. What you got? What you got? I had more. Where did I put them somewhere else or did I write it somewhere else? Oh yeah. I mean the fact that this white kid invented rock and roll. Yeah. He invented the black politician. <laughs> he what else did he invent? He invented wealth for his family. Yep. Um uh, all the consumerism, but that's the eighties, man. That's that's the Reagan years. That's what's happening in yep. the eighties. So just seeing that reflected, um, annoying. <laughs> There's no no excuse for it. But the, like the whole point of this podcast is to look back at those things and realize, you know, maybe we shouldn't cherish these. Or we can, but we need to realize the bad parts too. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with everything you said. It's it's also been uh, noted and, and talked about in, in, at length by many other people, far more qualified than I. Um, but I enjoyed learning about this stuff. Um, one of mine is um, 
when Doc steps out of the DeLorean for the first time, the amount of smoke <laughs> that, that piles out of there. <laughs> um, you would notice that. What, what's wrong with the smoke, man? Well, Cheech and from, Chong. I know. I know. Hey, if it was, if that's what it was, <laughs> I'd be all for it. But, uh, so as, as an actual like production person, I don't know what he was doing in there to, to get oxygen. Because yeah. he's, he's sitting in the car full of smoke. I don't know if he's holding his breath. But that, that's actually particulate smoke. It's either smoke. It, it shouldn't be CO2. If it's CO2, it's going to completely displace the oxygen. So I don't know if he had an air tank while he was in the car. And then they yelled action and he opens the door and it comes out. But that's way too much of whatever it is to be sitting in <laughs> waiting for the director to go. <laughs> And it like, like the re- it's, it's noted in other things I've seen, but it, that never happens in the movie ever again. There's no more like smoke or fog or whatever piling out of the, the car. So like, what was it? What was that smoke? Something I never noticed and <laughs> it's a lot. never the, care about. The, the next time you watch it, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's a lot of, that's a lot that's of smoke. too much smoke, man. Yeah. Blown smoke. I, I, think I think it was a Cheech and Chong reference. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> um, I have another nitpick. It's, it's a real nitpicky thing. And it's, it's not even really from this movie. So at the, uh, if you're, if you can remember the end of the second movie, when the DeLorean's flying up above and it gets struck by lightning mm. and the, the fire trails make the, looks like a couple of nines. I don't remember that. Okay. Well, normally the, the fire trails are on the street, you know, it goes between their legs. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yes. So there's at the end of the second movie. You know, Doc doesn't even want to, he's not even trying to go back in time or whatever, but he gets struck by lightning and there's two little nines appear. And there's some discussion on the, on the internet, of course, like what do the nines mean? Are they upside down sixes? What are they in reference to? Blah, 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 blah. One thing I haven't seen, which I noticed rewatching the first movie in the background of the lightning scene or at, at the, you know, at the end, there's a sign for an auto shop with the same shape of a nine, a yellow Ooh. arrow that goes around. If you go back and watch it, you'll see it. But at the, the name of the shop is Western Auto. So the, so the nines at the, at the end of the second movie are in reference to Western because he goes back in time to the West. Hmm. But like, I haven't, nobody's, I haven't, as far as I can tell, nobody else has noticed this connection. And Maybe I, it's a lasso. Eh, I don't know. But I, I, <laughs> I, I noticed that I noticed this sign in this movie after reading this and like it's just obvious if you watch them together and you look at the sign okay. you'd be like oh yeah that's what that is there's no other shape like it weird six 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 devil yeah i don't know yeah but yeah that's my that's they're into in the 80s Tip yeah or oh yeah big big old <laughs> satanic panic uh-huh. um but yeah that that's my you know stupid nitpick it's not so much it's not the movies at all it's the people on the internet that i'm nitpicking gotcha okay yeah. <laughs> your people are all wrong people are wrong <laughs> Uh, let's go ahead and take our second ad break. So we're back with Act Three, the award categories. Mm. Uh, let's start with who won the movie. I put Doc. Okay. I w- I wanted to put anybody anybody but Marty. Oh yeah. I, I kind of have a <laughs> like like you mentioned. Um, he is the White Knight, the kind of the problem in the movie. <laughs> But yeah, I like yeah, Doc. He's, he's the white savior. Yeah. Yeah. Doc's Doc's invention worked. He was right. He's got vindication. He's got he's got a time machine now. He I was thinking of it also in terms of like, I guess how I interpreted that question was like, I don't know about solely acting, but kind of like Crispin, he has sort of this theatrical feel that is like he's eccentric. He's allowed to be eccentric, but he also grounds the whole movie mm-hmm. in the same way um i don't understand how they met if it's just in this space time continuum loop like why are they so close right i never understood that part but we might get into that but i think i think yeah. doc just in terms of what he did in the movie um maybe christopher lloyd won the movie yeah very good i i like that a lot i actually didn't write anything down because i i sat and thought about it and i couldn't come up with i mean there's there's tons of great acting there's tons of great characters and performances. And I, I got to say, I, I like the Michael J. Fox version. I can imagine the Eric Stoltz version of this movie and, and it being very different and just not, not succeeding. I like Eric Stoltz, 
But this is the wrong part for him. Yeah, we're going to get masks if we, if we have masks. <laughs> yeah. Doing Back to the Future. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, my new band name. You got any, you got any memorable quotes? Oh, you know, I always turn any kind of name like this into a drag name. So I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of band name, my first one was Flux Capacity. Right on. I also have Buttheads. Because <laughs> they were, you know, Marty's band was the Pinheads. Right. Um, Oedipus Complex. Yeah, there you go. That's a uh, very yep. poignant, probably probably deeper than the movie ever thought to make it. And then, uh, of course, one point one, uh, one point twenty one gigawatts. Gigawatts, right on. Yeah, are, like are, gigs, hundred gigs. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I got this. Uh, I I forgot about this gag that uh, Doc Brown says, but uh, it's it's the only one I wrote down. It's a uh, rhythmic ceremonial ritual. <gasps> I love that line so much. That's what he calls the under the sea dance. I really uh, wanted to use that for something. I had it in my head, but yeah, that's that's good. It's so it. it's it's so. That's the name of a song. Is it? I think it's good. No, I think that would be the name of a song. Okay. Instead of a band. Very, yeah. Very very well could be. I I do that a lot on here. So. <laughs> my opinion. <laughs> um, updated movie title for 2023. Would does this movie need one? No. Yeah, I, I put down it's too iconic. Is there's no way no. to to redo nope. this story with a different name? It's just it wouldn't. Everyone would be like, "No, it's Back to the Future." Shut up. Absolutely not. Oh wait, actually, did I write some? <laughs> I say no because I really meant no, but then I wrote some down. <laughs> uh, heck, okay. These are dumb though. McFly me to the future. <laughs> um. Oh well, this is going uh, when we talk about this later. Uh, make the future great again. Oh boy. Yeah, so kind of like this MAGA esque uh, <laughs> nostalgia fifties thing going on. Gotcha, gotcha. I see the connection there. I was like, no, it doesn't need a name, and then I come up with some dumb names. I love it. It's mm. a very, very difficult category. We almost never come up with anything. Maybe you need to take that question out them for future. Uh... Yeah, we. So every ten episodes, we're gonna <laughs> do like a, a rewrite or mm. a revamp, and, and try to like hone in, you know, and. There's a couple on here that are kind of redundant and yeah, we just need to sit down and we need, mm, gotcha. we need, we need feedback too. So af after we're done with this, I'd love to hear anything you, you, any changes, ideas you have. Mm, okay. Um, we reach out for feedback. We don't get any except from our friends. So I'll, I'll take anything, sure. you know, any, any outside okay. perspective. So the mm -hmm. Roger Deakins would be proud award for cinematography. Um, this, this whole film is great for me. It's, it's Dean Kundi. He's, you know, obviously talented and competent. Um, are there any scenes that stood out for you? No, no scenes for me. It was more just, um, I, get, I don't think this is cinematography necessarily. What plays a part is the, the special effects. <laughs> special, quote unquote. Right. It was very, I think at the time, great. But now looking back on it, like the disappearing hand. Yeah, yeah, it's rough. And, you know, like that that kind of stuff was kind of like, rant, rant, and like the flames going through the legs. Uh huh. Yeah, it's it's mismatched. So I think on the the first one when we're we're doing a reverse shot and they're we have the car's point of view, the flames do get lit up between their legs, but when we go behind them, they're actually on a blue screen, and you can see like it doesn't match. It's a bit off. Yeah, Not they, at didn't, all. they didn't have they didn't have like special effects supervisors back then. It's kind of you know they didn't they did, but they they didn't they weren't on set all the time and planning things out the way they do now with computers and and they were like, uh, hey, nobody will notice. That's fine. Yeah, it's a really quick shot. But right. um, it's, Very it was now. yeah, yeah. But it was done by ILM, so Industrial Light and Magic, mm, um, the same mm, people. Yeah. You know, it was under that was back when it was under uh, George Lucas, Lucasfilm, and that's actually one of the reasons why the movie was almost filmed in Petaluma. <gasps> Petaluma was almost Hill Valley. No, yeah. I was having this theory that it's the, it was Courtyard Square, Santa Rosa. There's there's that mind. too. I don't I don't know what it looked like back in the eighties. Probably not like that. Probably yeah. like that. But uh, I was also thinking Sonoma Square. That's yeah, a huge, beautiful so. park. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's the that's one of my favorite things about this movie is that it was almost made in Petaluma. Because we have <laughs> we have so many movies that are made in Petaluma. That's true. Because it has that 1950s old town look. But yeah, I mean, ILM. Yeah, the effects are very dated. But that's part of the nostalgia for me. I really liked the uh, the practical effects that were added to the DeLorean, like all the, the wiring and the stuff on the outside. I thought they did a really good job of making it look like a time machine. 
It's not DeLorean is iconic and a space machine and a, yeah. or a like a space invader. What is it? A UFO. Yep. Comic book UFO. But uh, for for me, I know watching it again this time with my eyes glued to the screen. The opening shot of the camera moving around Doc's laboratory mm. and watching all the robots and stuff. That's all. That's all a one take. And it tells all the beginning story exposition. There isn't a person feeding it to you. So it's like, these are all the clues. This is what's mm. happening. This tells you how the story is before the first person even shows up in the camera. I thought that was brilliantly done. Because usually- I can't the, take my eyes off that every time I see it. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Wow. There, there's just enough eye candy and, and clues to keep you watching and tell you everything you need to know to jump into the story. Except- why does Marty have the keys to his place? Yeah, they just knew each other. Why are they so close? Eh, who knows? Why? Why? Because we need the movie to happen. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> just, <laughs> just let it fine. go. Let it go. Fine, fine. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, the rest of the film is, is very easily watchable and entertaining. There's, there's no, it doesn't get boring. There's no, I don't know. I don't have any critiques of it, really. Nope. Cool. So the uh, Hans Gruber Deathfall Award. You remember Hans Gruber? Why do I know that name? Uh, Die Hard, the very end of Die Hard. Alan Rickman mm. is is the is the villain Hans Gruber. That's right. And it's this Ugh. it's this cinematic shot of him falling off the building, <laughs> just getting smaller and smaller. Um, that's just oh, I love it. That's just what I named the award. But um, I put I down it. I put that's down uh, Biff falling down on the car at the the final punch. Mm. That's, that's a pretty dramatic fall. Oh, the twirly, twirly fall? Yeah, and then just the, the collapse. And... <laughs> yeah, the big tree going down. Um, I missed that question. Am I supposed to, like, nope. who does... Nope, nope. If, you don't, if okay. you don't come up with anything, don't worry about it. Okay, I think I missed that. Uh, controversial hot take. You got any, anything, any ideas that would make someone rewatch this with a different light? This is a Trump propaganda movie. Oh, where you Love. go back in time and everything's great again. You're more prosperous. You have a chance to redo everything. You are the savior in every respect. But also, there's it like it. The movie thinks it's a liberal movie, but it's really a conservative movie. Interesting. That's my hot take. Right on. I love it. I we we, we live for the hot takes. <laughs> I would I would put Zemeckis and Gale as conservatives for sure. Oh yeah, and fiscal conservatives because they mentioned we have Ronald Reagan uh -huh. mentioned, even though like well he's an actor. Yeah, there's a there's a story I read. I don't know if I believe it or not, but they the film had to go in front of Reagan to get approved. But then I, I read another story where they watched it for the first time with Reagan and or, or Ronald and Nancy while they're on vacation, and there was like a, a weird awkward thing because they mentioned his his previous wife. But it also says that that was the first time he watched it. So I don't know which I don't know which story to believe. I really don't care. Yeah, I read one that said, "Oh, he paused it at that line when they said, what do you mean the actor?'" And then had him redo it again. But he also liked it. Yeah, so who knows? Who knows? A uh, bunch of lying turds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I dig it. I can totally understand it. It is, and it's pretty true. Like, well, isn't number two? <clears throat> excuse me. So I haven't seen it in a while. I saw them back to back at the cult movie theater or the cult movie thing in Santa Rosa. And wasn't the second one like Biff is basically Trump? Or maybe we were all seeing it through that lens because Trump had just gotten elected when we all saw it. Because like he had this book and he was super well, there's, Trumpian. There was that. But I, I think because the, cause the movie came out before Trump became that kind of Trump. And it was it was really it was I don't know if he if he existed as that kind of villain in order for them to model Biff off of. But I think they just modeled Biff off of what would happen. Not in New York. In New York, he was very much known as, well, I mean, he said he was a Democrat back then, but he, the people in New York, a lot of people I, I know, he was a villain. I mean, he did the whole take okay. out the paper ad in That's right. Central Park Five. That's right. Yeah. He, like my aunt actually would see him out at like Studio 54, like preening and like, he was known as a dick. Okay. I, I you was know? On, uh, yeah. And so for sure in New York, he was known as a big old douchebag. Right on. So there's a, there's a chicken and the egg issue here then. Yes. And, and yeah, I'm, I totally see what you're saying. And a lot of people 
go back to the second film as as being prescient of what was coming. Mm. So I don't I don't know. Real and, time I, travel I, happened, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and I don't I don't know. I mean, they they obviously created a good villain. I don't know how far they leaned into Trump, and then it just became obvious once Trump became president. I that, mean that hair. <laughs> the hair alone. It's very, very true. I need to study the second film now to to like yep. think about that more. But it was it's very it's very the connection's been made. Uh, yeah. In the past yep. five years, easily. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I don't know. Do I hate this movie now? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> See, I ruined it for you. <laughs> my my controversial hot take, which I wrote down during one of our breaks because I couldn't think of anything, is that. Marty's kind of a turd. He kind of Marty. Yeah, he kind of mm-hmm. gets everything he wants. He has to. He has to fight for some of it, but he's still white knighting. Literally. I don't know. He is manipulative. But it's not that it's not motivated, but I don't know. I don't like Marty. If if I knew him, I yeah. probably probably wouldn't hang out with him. I can see that. Yeah, he didn't. Watching it now, I, I was kind of like neutral towards Marty. You lost your lost your love. I or... lost my love. Um, yeah, you know, I think it was more about like he was cute and his put his. I always put his hand behind his head. I think he just his physicality and he did a lot of physical humor in the movie. Like it just he worked for the part. He did it well, yeah, for sure. But, but other I, than that, yeah, he's kind of a, he's I, kind of. I like Michael neutral. J. Fo- I like Michael J. Fox, but I don't like Marty. Yes. Yeah, we we can separate those two. I think. I think so. Cool. I'm I'm happy again. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> Uh, how about uh, time for another Spider-Man award? Would there be need for a remake or a reboot? Please don't. <laughs> That's what, That's I what, beg of you. I mean, there was a stage play, right? There was there was a play and a TV show for a short time. That's right. In the early I would 90s. I see the play, maybe. Okay. I mean, maybe if there was cool effects. I mean, if they were in it again. If they were in it, I would go. If If they, yeah. if they were in the movie or if they were in the play, I would go. This this might change your mind about Christopher Lloyd, but uh, he wanted to do number four where they go back to ancient Rome. Hmm. I'm slightly intrigued. <laughs> uh, it seems like a disaster, <laughs> no. disaster to me. Yeah, I was done by three. I was like, all right, what's Yeah, one? yeah, totally. Movie. Well, well, lucky for us, uh, Bob Zemeckis and Bob Gale have it written into their contract because they own the rights to the movie that mm-hmm. is for, for as long as they live, it will not be remade or rebooted. Well, they're getting up there. Yeah. This could happen in our lifetime, Luke. It, it could be me. We could. We could. Uh, <gasps> let's let's okay. let's if write number four. And, yeah, if you let me consult, <laughs> we, we can talk. Hell yeah! All right, cool. We'll we'll get started and and hope for the death of <laughs> two old white men. <laughs> That's my hot take. I'll put that there. Okay, I like it. Uh, the be kind, please rewind award. Uh, good or bad? Is it worth the rewatch? And would you show it to someone who's never seen it before? A thousand times, yes. Yep, same. Uh, despite its its foibles, its problems, and maybe it's even more important to show somebody and point out the problems to yeah. to like kind of link to the mentality that we have today and contrast and compare. You know, or not. Uh, the Neil Breen Struggle for Relevance Award. Uh, do you know who Neil Breen is? I do not. Okay, he's a. <laughs> I'll send you a link to some of his stuff. He's a. Very aspiring filmmaker, but one of the worst. <laughs> um, yeah. And that's, that's, I think, saying it very nicely. Mm. He is, uh, he's the writer, director, and hero of all of his films. And they are the worst things you'll ever see. But they're, they're so, or, so bad that they're good, that they're funny. At least for a little while. Is, it, is that the one that James Franco tried to no, do? No, no. This, oh, okay. is, this is beyond that even. <laughs> Oh wow! Beyond that, okay. Uh-huh. I'll, I'll I'll send you some stuff. Uh, Please but, do. But this category, I mean, he's he has themes. He he likes to talk about um, saving the environment and stuff like that. But these yeah. are he's just doing it because it is a popular theme. He doesn't really care about the environment or anything like that. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, this 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 award is kind of a, a redundant thing, anyways. But the struggle for relevance are, are this movie and its themes relevant today? And I, I was trying to think. What are the themes? What are the the morals? I mean, I'm going back to it's the whole make America great again thing. I don't that's probably just my biased lens. But, gotcha. Yeah, I, I can totally um, understand that. Doubling down, as they say. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I could think of was I uh, take a chance, be brave. But the, it's kind of a it's really watered down. Not very strong. 
I don't know. It's just you can a fun. Do anything you put your mind to. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Oh boy. You can be rich if you, it's basically like consumerism to me. Like you can have a lot of stuff, be rich on things. Um, if you, what, stand up for yourself, get the girl, ugh, protect the ones you love. It's very fifties. Yeah. It's pretty lame. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, <re> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's, that's moment. fine. No, yeah. it's a, uh, <laughs> There's, there's, if there's nothing there, it's a very Neil Breen thing. So it, it works. Okay. Okay. Uh, rainy day pairing, the best double feature or triple feature for this movie while under a blanket at home with snacks. I, e. I put E.T. Right on. Mm. You, you didn't even want to stick with the franchise, huh? You're going for a whole other nope. movie. Yep. <laughs> awesome. I was lazy and I just put down two and three. Yeah. But because that, that's pretty much what I do. If I ever am watching the first one, two and three are just. They're naturally on afterwards. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. From my, from my nostalgia point of view, it's going to be E.T. And then if I want to do a triple, I'll throw in top then. There you go. I don't know if you've watched that recently. I watched the new one. Okay. I watched the old one. It's bad. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like I'm really, sure it's bad. really, really bad. And, and not to be a uh, crass or anything, but really, really gay. Like a not... I'm not saying lame. I mean, like, yeah, it is homoerotic. Oh, to, absolutely. To the core, like, and they all have great cores. So. Oh yeah, Grace, uh, Goose, and uh, <clears throat> what's his name? Goose. Uh, Maverick. What's his name? Maverick. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> yeah, the outfits, the hair, the volleyball, the, smiles, the, the love, the volleyball. Yeah. Oh yeah, I noted that on the new one. I was like, this is such a gay scene. <laughs> yeah, just going for it. And she was. She came out after that movie, right? Kelly McGillis. And Did she come like, out? What? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, there's this, there's this whole thing, this whole like question, because in the movie, the love scene isn't really a love scene. It's kind of just them sitting, I don't know, in bed. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's like the, the same thing happens. She's in like, the, nah, fam. <laughs> right, right. And there's just the second thing happens in the, in the second movie, whether they either get interrupted or it just doesn't happen. Ugh. So there's a question yeah. of whether or not, uh, What's his name is even good at like sex scenes. He did like Eyes Wide Shut, but even then, I don't remember. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I it's really a don't. Bromance. It's a, it's all about the bro the friendship, quote unquote. Bromance, quote unquote. <laughs> the homoeroticism. No quotes. Yeah. No. I yeah, it was great. I mean, the movie's bad, but it it's a it's I have a, to watch. It's an eye candy. I don't know. It it did like crazy for Navy recruitment when it came out. That's. And it's somewhat ironic, but that's exactly why my dad went back into the service was Top Gun. Like it was just really? a he was in the Navy. He got out to go to college so he can go back in as an officer and become a pilot. What? But he, he had a, a knee injury, so he ended up going in the army instead. But that was, that was that was exactly why he tried to go back in the Navy was to become a pilot. <gasps> I wonder how many people can you make that Th film? Thousands, yeah. Or that documentary. It, it's out there, I think. I, I think there's some some stuff how many about people it. went back into the military due to that or just just, just just joined it was it was made in concert with the department of defense so like they they made it department of defense <sighs> oversaw it because they had to use all their their toys you know their airplanes and the right and the stuff so in order to do that they they made it a recruitment tool and that's oh exactly what it was 1986 <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> anyways it yeah it, it worked really well um all right, the next one, the Sonic Death Monkey Top 5. Wait, what did you say? It cut out a little bit. The, the Sonic Death Monkey Top 5. Do you, do you remember? Um, Sonic Monkey Top 5. <laughs> did I miss that one? Uh, uh, possibly. It, it was at the end. This is the very last one. Oh, I might have missed that. But uh, Sonic, um, have you ever, have you ever seen um, High Fidelity? Yes. John, John, John Cusack, Jack Black. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Sonic Death Monkey is, their, is the name of their band. Oh, at that's the end right. of the film. And this is this is taken directly from the movie where they sit down, okay, and give me your top five songs that ever made you sad. So this is the I, I mean I kind of spaced on this one, but I put down what are your top five top five time travel movies. Okay, yeah, that's what I meant. So it was a top it was a travel movie. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> well, I have this um thing called being a seasoned person on the planet where I don't remember <laughs> things anymore unless sure. I 
look at something else. So when I looked at the things, when I looked at lists, I was like, oh yeah, okay. So we're going with um, some lists that I saw that like struck that nostalgia chord with me, Time Bandits. Okay. I saw that uh, floating around too. I don't think I've ever seen it. So I should, I should put that on my list, huh? <laughs> Terry Gilliam. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going with Bill and Ted's. All right, that was that was almost on my list. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't remember. It's like I really don't remember movies unless I like. Oh yeah, no, the they. Ones I uh. I saw. And and the movie um. High fidelity they they come up with these on the spot and they think about them but for this i i say like everyone needs to like go and look at imdb look at a list oh wait here's another list yeah my brain doesn't work that way so I have nobody to does like, okay. yeah uh, oh it doesn't no you people who think about and talk about film all the time i bet you had some in your mind eh. um already there's probably more recent ones that i've seen like bridget would probably say something like it's that one is cloud atlas one of them or something Oh, was it? That's another one I haven't seen. Or like Sliders, one of them. Okay. I don't know. I think I remember that. Yeah, I don't have much to say on that one just because okay. I don't remember movies other than when I saw that list. It was like, oh yeah, Time Bandits for sure. Okay. I'll check um, it out. Yeah. And uh, Bill and Ted's. Bill and Ted's. Right on. I got, um, you ever seen Idiocracy? No. Okay. That one... I don't know if it would work for someone who's never seen it before, but it is pretty funny. It's it's one of those older two uh, thousands movies where okay. it's not it's not bad. I mean, it's funny. Uh, you might want to try it. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. But it's it's Luke Wilson, and I'm uh, spacing on her name, but she's amazing. She's an amazing actor. Anyways, they do an army experiment. It's written by Mike Judge, the guy who does Beavis and Butthead. Yeah. And they, they do an army experiment where they go into cryo and they wake up 500 years in the future and everyone's really dumb. <laughs> yes. So it's it. pretty, it's pretty funny. Like it's, 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 that I mean, amazing. and yeah. that, that's another like, uh, people, uh, metaphor people or a simile people made with the Trump presidency and the era we lived in. Mm. So there's a lot of that and it's from the late nineties, I think. So it's, it's kind of prescient. That I, sounds funny. Yeah. I think it's be, I think it'll be worth watching if you've never seen it. Okay. Um, number four for me is Terminator 2. I like the Terminator movies. I don't remember two specifically. I think that's the first one that kind of turned me on to filmmaking and stuff. Mm. It was just really well done, I think. Stuck with me. At the time, I was living in an apartment complex right next to a mall that had a movie theater. So I could walk over and just could go oh. into the movie theater. It was awesome. Dreamy. Uh, number three, 12 Monkeys. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Really weird, really bad brad pitt performance but i i do watch that all the time uh number two and this this questions can be kind of vague it can, it can be kind of uh you, you can wander but for number two i have groundhog day <gasps> Duh, yeah so it's not necessarily stepping in a time machine but like yeah. things that mess with time yeah uh, groundhog day was great i've seen that a million yep. times thousands of times um and then my number one is eternal sunshine of the spotless mind oh yeah and that, that's that's like awesome time. there's a yeah. There's like a loop that they end up doing inside of the movie while they're forgetting each other and themselves. Which I, remembering. I, yeah. That's my, my favorite kind of movie is the unreliable narrator and, you know, a mind fuck kind of fuck with reality movie. That's my yeah. favorite. Yeah. Yeah. The Eternal Sunshine is my number one time travel movie. That's how much is I like that it. that Charlie Kaufman thing? Yeah, it's Charlie Kaufman. Okay. Okay. I'll have He's, to watch that. He's, he's got yeah, some, my some brain problems. doesn't work, doesn't remember things that way anymore. Talk talk about uh, man boy, uh, need, needing uh, women, needing women to come in and save his life and all that stuff. Oh really? Okay. It's it's a it's a, it's, it's a theme in Charlie Kaufman movies. I've I've come to understand is that it, it's like you said, like the Jennifer thing. She's always there to like help Marty and yeah, be the support. Yeah, it's never yeah, never, it's never like really has her own yeah. never really has her own yeah agency mm-hmm. or whatever. Right on. So that's my top five. And uh, once cool. I see time bandits, I'll let you know if it, that changes. Yeah, you're going to want to do a whole episode on that. <laughs> right on. Uh, so on to the epilogue. At the end of every episode, we do a verdict whether or not we think a film should live. Or we should continue to monitor, to monitor it to see if our attitudes change. 
or just kill it outright and never watch it again. What's what's your verdict? Duh. <laughs> Live forever. Same. I I'm I'm teetering on uh the second one continuing to monitor it, but I think we've hashed out pretty much all the horrible things in it. Mm-hmm. So as, as long as we watch it through that lens, we can we can enjoy the nostalgia of it, I think. If someone does that remake on stage or film or whatever, yeah, that would have to be looked at. Yeah, we'd have to we'd have sure. to come up with something smarter. My my interpretation of all this stuff, all this this uh this just meanness and mean jokes and stuff from the past, a lot of it is just lazy. It's just like when people gave up on writing jokes, they they didn't go for clever, they went for mean and got mm. the easy got the easy laughs. And like that's the stuff I hate the most. Easy laughs. But it's also not examining your own ideas and your own biases and your own prejudices and your own really like kind of white supremacy if i might say that and within the yeah. um industry and it's that's like that- oh these things are universal so we're just gonna write them in and they're easy but why are they easy like those are things we i was not thinking about at 13 oh, yeah. and you do or the writers <laughs> oh yeah totally yeah we don't we don't do a lot of apologizing or uh, make excuse for people, but it was the era. It was the, you know, that's just how America was horribly racist and sexist. <laughs> from, Definitely the era. Yeah. From, from forever up until um, just recently, but it still is. <laughs> but it still is. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Right on. Very exactly. good. So we're going to let it live. Uh, probably going to watch it again. Oh, yeah. Over and over and over. Uh, so pluggables. Uh, should we plug your Twitch? Yeah. Um, I need to get you hard. graphics. Yeah. I know. Uh, I'll, I'll try to do that today. Yeah, whenever. Um, yeah, I still am setting some stuff up and I want to get a... Yeah, anyway. Yes, it's coming. Um, so I have it right uh, here. It's twitch.tv slash DJ2smalls, T-O-O smalls. Yes. And Two you're, smalls in the house. Right on. And you're going to be playing your old records and tapes? Yeah, so I'm going to be playing um, what is left of my record collection and what I'm trying to rebuild from what I unfortunately had to sell back in the day that I uh, regret horribly and some cassettes that I have of my old radio shows plus old cassettes. And I think I'm going to add some CDs to the mix. Okay. So, um, yep, CDs, cassettes, records, who knows what's going to happen. Right on the the cassette. Talking, is, talking nostalgia. We're talking yeah, nostalgia. Exactly. The the cassette playing thing is is new to me. I've never seen anybody do that, and I'm very interested in listening to those. I haven't either. I probably if I dig deeper, there are probably people doing it. I know there is this one guy. I can't remember if he's in Japan or Korea who was mixing on cassettes. I'm sure there's more people doing that, but oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I will not be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, Erica, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this horrible horrible movie <laughs> torture <laughs> thanks for having me and asking yeah me totally to do this. This is a lot we, of fun. we want to do a lot more um i think for the next couple of weeks probably even the next month we'll be doing stuff just with the uh either with the three founders of the podcast or try to get some other celebrities on three founders you chuck and me chuck and uh, javier martinez is our oh javier i heard him yeah. on the last one okay yeah all, all three of us uh, went to film school at the jc so we're that's, there that's, you that's go how we all know each other and we've, we've been trying for it. years to figure out how to get some kind of ritual where we meet up every week and talk so this is it it's working you're doing it that's Hell exciting yeah. so i have been luke loans this is Erica Smallin, DJ Two Smalls. And this was the Nostalgia Killers. Yeah.